with us to Luke 11 if, you, uh, if, if you've not already done so. Jesus um, has a message in this passage of Scripture. His message is that many people put on a facade of godliness outwardly. They look really good. They do that to fool others, but in the process, they generally end up believing it themselves and become self-deceived, which is one of the most awful places in the world to be. Outwardly, thinking we have it together when inside, death lurks. And we haven't really dealt with what's inside. We're just putting paint on the outside. We're like a fellow named Pete who had appendix, appendix problem, right? And he went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you need an operation. So he went and got the operation. He got home. His friend Bill came to visit him. He said, uh, he said how are you doing? How do you feel? He said, I feel great. He said, only one problem. He said, I, they, they told me they, they sewed me up and left a sponge inside. And Bill said, well, does that, does that hurt? And Pete said, no, it doesn't hurt, but boy, I sure am thirsty these days. <laughs> well, over time, I would imagine that would not only hurt, but cause serious damage. Everything seems fine on the surface, see, but inside, a, a death lurks. That's the way it is with those who are moralists, those who feel they can earn their way to God by some outward mechanism, whatever it may be. They may be pillars of the community, but inside, the killer lurks. And so Jesus is warning. You're just a well-dressed corpse if that's who you are. Just a well-dressed corpse. I don't want you to be that. You are moralists. Paul describes them in 2 Timothy 3.15. He says they are those who are those who are having the appearance of godliness, but who are denying the power thereof. They have no power. Dead people have no power. Now in this passage, Jesus teaches us seven ways that we dress ourselves up morally. So as we look through these, you could think of them as different suits of clothing, I suppose, that a moralist might wear. You could think of these as ways of looking out and spotting a moralist. I'd much prefer that you do what Jesus is wanting to do, which is to begin to look at yourself and say, am I the one who is dressed up this way? Is this me? We looked at two last week. We'll look at two more today and then the, the rest of them next week. But we saw last week, what is it that characterizes a moralist? Number one, they are exhibitionists of externals. They're externally focused. They're far more worried about what you think about them than they are about what God thinks about them. Moralists are about the outward. The chief characteristic of moralists, this is kind of the umbrella category really, is that they are focused on what is external. They believe that they can somehow please God by what they do. Their, their creed, their creed would be you know, something like the old creed they used to tell us when we were kids. I don't drink, drink and I don't smoke and I don't go with girls who do. So that's the creed of the moralist. He's all outward. So true moralism, to the moralist, it's all about what you do. To God, it's all about who you are inside. We forget that God always looks on the heart. This will help your Bible study, frankly, almost more than any other single item I can think of to tell you, which is to remember God always looks on the heart. And he makes a lot of statements throughout the Bible that sometimes taken out of context could seem strange, but when you realize he's looking at the heart, it begins to make sense. So they are exhibitionists of external. Secondly, a moralist is one who trivializes truth. Trivializes truth. He just picks on the small things and decides, I'm going to go there. This is a little thing I can do. For the Pharisees to whom Jesus was speaking, that little thing that they thought they could do was tithe. The tithe. That was their ace in the hole, was the fact that they were great tithers. Apparently, we don't have a lot of those around today. I'm grateful for the way our church responds, but on average, the evangelical people give 2.5% of their, of their money to 
some kind of charity or church work, which is a slightly below the 10% that would be a tithe. But the Pharisees were very concentrated on that. That was the thing that they did that they thought would be the thing that would for sure get them in with God. We probably have something different today. If it's not our tithing, it's something else. It may be that we, hey, we are very proud of the fact that we get our kids to Sunday school. We never think about the fact that if we're not going, and if we're not participating, and if we're not in church, we're just fooling ourselves. We're certainly not fooling God. We're absolutely not fooling our kids. All the kids are learning is, hey, I got to go to church now, but when I'm adult, I don't need it anymore. That's what the kids are learning. Trivializing truth. We do that when we think that we can work for some charity, maybe once a month, go help out at the soup kitchen or something else, and that'll get me in with God. Well, that's a great thing to do, and I hope you do it with a heart that is really toward God if you do that, but it will not earn your way to heaven. Or perhaps we think, yeah, I get, hey, listen, I get to church, I, you know, at least on Communion Sunday. Um, if I get there another time or two, certainly God will be you know, okay with that. All these things that trivialize truth cause us not to look deep into our heart to find the evil that lurks there. God wants us to get deeper, beloved. So we are trivializers of truth, moralists are. So that's the first two we looked at last week. Third one that we'll take this week, moralists are passionate about position. They are passionate about position. They want recognition with a capital R. That's a moralist. And it doesn't really matter what the category is, something that they give, they want their name on it. Something that they do, they want to make sure that somebody acknowledges that they did that, they want recognition. That was the Pharisees. Look at them in verse 43. Jesus says, woe to you Pharisees. For you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. What he's saying is these guys are nothing, they're just consummate ladder climbers. They want recognition, they want position, they want people to know who they are. Somehow feeling that the more forward that they can be, the more they will be in with God. That, you know, when I read that part about, you know, they like the chief seats in the synagogues, I can't help but have this picture in my mind. And I hope my old seminary professors will forgive me, but when, when I was in seminary, we had a daily chapel. And the seminary professors, the, the men who taught there, were aligned on the, on, the, on the platform facing the audience. Now, I'm not saying they were Pharisees, although when it was your turn to do a uh, you know, a class sermon, if you're selected to do class sermon, you probably thought they were Pharisees because they were back there marking as fast as they could. Seemed a little pharisaical, but they were actually asked to do that. It wasn't something they necessarily sought, but in the case of the Pharisees, that's what they wanted. In the synagogues, somebody would read a passage of Scripture, and then he would go and sit down somewhere in the center of the stage and teach. That's why you find in Luke 4, Jesus sitting down. But that didn't mean he was done. He was just sitting to the position that he, that he taught from. But the elders of the community would be lined up behind them, facing the audience, same as those seminary professors. But they wanted that. This was their acknowledgement that they were important and that they were critical people in the community. And so their ranking was kind of determined by where they sat in the synagogue. And if they couldn't actually get on the platform, they at least wanted to be as far forward as possible. This was the Pharisees. They wanted to be seen in all the right places. And they loved greetings in the marketplace. And the nature of those greetings, Matthew tells us about in Matthew 23, where Jesus says they love, the, they love the place of honor at feasts, and they love the best seats in the synagogues, and the greetings in the marketplaces, and they loved being called rabbi, teacher, by others. They thrived on that. They, they, they just reveled in recognition. They, they loved it. They wanted to be recognized. They thought it was a sign of their righteousness and that it would get them to heaven. 
It never occurred to them, although it should have because it was all there in the Old Testament that a clean heart was part of the equation. By far the most important part. They wanted recognition. They wanted to be called rabbi. They wanted to be called teacher. They were failing to real, realize, beloved, that titles are meaningless to God. You can be called pastor. You can be called parson. You can be called elder. You can be called deacon. You can, you can be called bishop, archbishop, cardinal. You can be called pope. It doesn't mean anything. Not to God. You check the titles at the door. When you go to heaven, there's only one title that means anything there. Child of God. And you don't get that by your own doing. You get it by receiving the work that Jesus did on the cross as your own, right? Would Jesus say, or John say in John 1, 12, as many as received him, those are the ones that he gave the power to, be, to become the children of God. You can't work your way into that. You can't earn your way into that. You can't educate your way into that. You can only receive it. Titles are meaningless. It's so easy to get pride of position, you know. I love this quote from Charles Spurgeon in lectures to my students. It was a problem in his day as well, which was in the 1870s, 1880s. He says this. He said, I know brethren who from head to foot in garb tone, manner, necktie, and boots are so utterly pastoral that no particle of manhood is visible. I'm not asking for any comments back on this one this morning, but you see the point. He wanted to be recognized. He goes on and he says, one young sprig of a divinity must needs go through the streets in a gown. And another of the high church order has recorded it in the newspapers with much complacency that he traversed Switzerland and Italy, wearing in all places his beretta, which was a, you know, was, a, was a stiff kind of a clerical cap, different colors depending on the rank. He says, few boys could have been so proud of a fool's cap. That was not a compliment. Pride of position, still with us. I had a friend in seminary who was asked to speak at the Easter sunrise service one year at the Hollywood Bowl. They put one on every year, interdenominational thing. And when he agreed, whoever was talking to him from the committee said, where would you like us to send the helicopter? <laughs> he, said, he said, helicopter. He said, he said, why would you send a helicopter? And they said, well, I, we don't know, but the guy last year insisted on having a helicopter. So we got one. With, where do you want it? He said, well, I can tell you, there's no room in my backyard for a helicopter. There's no room in my street for a helicopter. Don't send the helicopter. And they said, okay, we'll send a police escort. And he said, don't send a police escort. My neighbors will hate me. I don't need to be waking them all up first thing in the morning. He said, I'll find my way there on my own, which he did. And he said when he got there, he ran into another participant who was dressed in T-shirt and shorts. That's a little casual even for Southern California for a big service like this, right? But he said, no, not to worry. He said, when the service started, this guy put on a robe of more colors than you could imagine. He said it would have made the Queen of Sheba blush. Strutting, ecclesiastical peacocks, beloved. We don't need. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with robes. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the title. But look out. So often it can become a covering, a facade that keeps us from looking inside to see the unrepentant heart that belongs, that, that, that exists there. Chief seats, special privileges, grand regalia, exalted titles, we're all susceptible. I was at one church where they were advertising their all-star worship band. And I thought, well, you can probably be an all-star or you can be a worship band, but I'm not sure you can be both. I understood what they meant, but I think the intent was misleading. I've known people who get all bent out of shape and refuse to serve because they're not giving the right position of leadership that they want. 
They can't be the head. They don't want to be anything. What Jesus is teaching, beloved, is we'd be much better off to be worried about our character than about our reputation and about our image. Our reputation is, you know, our reputation is who people think we are. Our character is who God knows we are. And sometimes in our own minds, we get the two confused. Child of God. That's the title we ought to revel in. That's the only title that counts. It's the only one that can help us when it comes to being a true believer. When I think of, you know, this kind of pride of position, I think of Arturo Toscanini, a story I read about him one time, you know, the great conductor. He was, he'd conducted a great rendition. I don't remember what what orchestra it was, but a great rendition of Beethoven's Ninth and the crowd just went wild. They were clapping and they were asking for encores and all the rest of it. When it got all done, as the, as the noise was subsiding, he turned to the orchestra and he said, gentlemen, he was obviously very moved. He said, gentlemen, I am nothing. Well, that was news because Toscanini was nothing if not an egotist, right? So that was news. But then he said, gentlemen, you are nothing. No news there. He'd been telling them that for the last two weeks of rehearsal, right? But then he said, Beethoven, gentlemen, Beethoven is everything, everything. He was so moved by the music. Beloved, that's how we need to be about Jesus Christ. Jesus is everything. We don't bring anything to this party. We don't. Jesus is everything. We have to ask if we bowed before his lordship. Are we counting on our own goodness somehow to get us in when it is only his goodness that can do that. Anything else is just dressing up the corpse. So, fourthly, they are distributors of defilement. Moralists are distributors of defilement. What that means is Think about what that means. It means not only are they defiled, but they're distributing it to others as well. Now that's an important thing that Jesus says when he tells these Pharisees in verse 44, woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves and people walk over them without knowing it. You know, it's hard for us to imagine what a horribly offensive accusation that was in those days. We don't think much about that, but the background to Jesus' comment here comes from Numbers chapter 19. Let me just read it for you. Numbers 19, we're in the law, 19 verse 16 is prescribed by God. The Lord says, whoever in the open field touches someone who was killed with a sword or died naturally or touches a human bone or a grave shall be unclean for seven days. Now we read that and we think, okay, so you're unclean for seven days. So it's a big deal. But see, in those days, to be ceremonially unclean was a big deal. It was a big deal, number one, because everybody knew it. Everybody knew you were unclean. You might as well be wearing a sign around your neck. It also meant you couldn't partake in normal interaction with human beings because you would corrupt them. So if you were a wife, you couldn't cook the meals anymore for a whole week. If you were a husband, you couldn't really partake with your family for a whole week. You were outside the camp. So it was bad enough to be ceremonially unclean for a whole week because you happened to accidentally touch a dead body or touch a grave if you were living at home. But if you came hundreds or maybe even thousands of miles to Jerusalem at the time of the feast in order, to, in order to give this sacrifice which had been prescribed and this was so important to you and you touched a grave and suddenly you're ceremonially unclean for seven days so you can't offer this sacrifice, that was a big deal. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, this is who you guys are. Because in those days in Jerusalem, everybody who lived in Jerusalem knew where the graves were, right? But some of them would get 
would get walked over and, you know, bushes would grow up, different things would happen. And so before the feast, they usually went around and tried to whitewash the graves. They marked them so that people could see them, so that the out-of-towners wouldn't accidentally walk over a grave and suddenly be unclean. And Jesus says to, the, to these Pharisees, that's you guys. You guys, are the, you guys are the unmarked graves. You're walking death. And people look up to you. People think you're good. They, they admire your piety. They revere you. They follow you. The things that you say, they try to do, not realizing that you're just filled with contamination. You carry disease with you wherever you go. You're a walking, unmarked grave. You're a corpse. You contaminate, you defile, you pollute, you destroy. I'll tell you what you are. You're the kiss of death. Now remember, this is at lunch, right? That Jesus is saying all this. What's he doing? He's trying to get their attention to realize who they really are. 1906, a doctor named George Soper, S-O-P-E-R, was called to a home of a kind of wealthy family in New York City. And he came and, the, and he said, still making house calls in those days, what do you need? They said, well, we've had a, an outbreak of typhoid. We need you to treat it. But we'd also like to find out because there have been other outbreaks of typhoid around this area. We need to find out where it's coming from. It wasn't obvious. So Soper treated the symptom and then he began to try to find the cause. And he found out there was a common element in every one of these cases, which was every one of these homes had had a, an Irish cook who was about 40 years old, but the problem was no one knew where she was. Every time typhoid broke out, she just moved on to a new residence, leaving no forwarding address or anything else, and nobody knew where she was. Well, he continued to track her down until he found Mary Mellon, M-A-L-L-O-N, Mary Mellon. She was the cook. She refused to cooperate in any way, refused to, to even suppose that perhaps she was in some way causing this ty typhoid outbreak. So Soper went to work and compiled a five-year history of all the places she'd been, and everywhere she'd been, there'd been typhoid. Well, that was enough to go to court and cause her to be medically examined. And what they found was, when they, when they finally tested her, was that her gallbla gallbladder was teeming with typhoid salmonella. She was perfectly healthy. There was nothing wrong with her but she was walking death for everybody that she came into contact with. She was typhoid Mary. And that's what Jesus is saying to these Pharisees. You guys are carrying the disease of spiritual death with you everywhere you go. Why? Because you are trying to get to God by illegitimate means. You're trying to work your way in, and you can't. But not only have you convinced yourselves, you, you've convinced others. So it's not just you who are missing salvation by grace through faith alone, but it's everybody who believes you. It's everybody who counts on you. They should have had signs around their neck. You know, they should have been like a cigarette package that had the, the warnings or had a sign that said carrier of spiritual death hanging around their neck. They should have been... You know, like the lepers that had to holler out unclean everywhere they went, but that wasn't required. They could roam free over a populace that looked up to them. And all the time they were leading others down the Broadway that leads to destruction. No wonder Jesus didn't mince any words when he talked to them here. His, his last words to them before he died, found in Matthew 23 again, verse 15, Jesus said to them, for you travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Can't say it any more clear than that, can you? He said, not only are you guys going to hell, you're taking others with you. Jesus is not patient with those, beloved, who pervert his gospel. 
And we have to be so careful. You know what? We can do this even with our little kids. We try very hard. Carla and I have conversations. How are we teaching our children? Do they walk away from our Sunday schools thinking it's all about being good? Should they learn to be good? Yes. But only as a born-again person who's come to faith in Christ who saved them through no work of their own. The gospel is free. That's why we're having a free day. But we leave the wrong impression so many times. And here's Jesus. You know, how would you feel? You get up and you take a bullet for somebody, fatal bullet, and you turn around and that person's standing up and saying, I'm invulnerable and being shot to death, and others are saying the same thing, and they're being shot to death. How would, you, how would you feel? And Jesus said this knowing that he's about to go to the cross, that this is the only way these people can be saved, that they are, te- they are not only defiled themselves, but they're defiling others by rejecting his message. So many pastors these days, so many churches, it's not about the cross anymore. It's not about substitutionary atonement. We have people in our evangelical community who are telling us it's, if you're teaching substitutionary atonement, that's like saying that God is a child abuser who sent his son to the cross. And the, you know what? The fact is, if it wasn't an atonement, he would be. But that's what proves it's not. God is no child abuser. God is one who knows that the only way of salvation is by faith, is by grace through faith alone in the person of Jesus Christ who died for our sins. We don't get saved by being good, but after we're saved, we will be good. Why? Because we'll want to. Once you understand the gospel, your whole orientation toward life changes. But beloved, it's not just the churches and other places that are teaching. You know, what about, what about, are you a carrier? I mean, are you a, do you realize how many people are depending on you? You have children who are depending on you, right? You have friends, you have relatives, you have neighbors. And you have an influence, spoken or unspoken, on all the people that you come in contact with. And here's my question. Do they know the gospel? Or do they think you're all about, because you go to church, it's all about being good, because if you are, if that's the impression you're, you're giving, you are a carrier, a distribution center for defilement. The whole concept that we can get saved by being good enough. So if that's not how we get saved, how do we get saved? Look at Luke 18. Turn, just turn with me there. Luke 18, just a couple pages over. Jesus contrasts these two positions as well as they could ever be contrasted. That's why this passage is in the Bible. Luke 18, beginning in verse 9. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Now keep in mind, when Jesus' audience heard this, the tax collector would have absolutely been the bad guy. The Pharisee would have been the good guy. In their minds, that's just the way it was. The Pharisee, verse 11, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector, Thank you, Lord. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. I don't know what it is in your life, but whatever it is that you're substituting that you think will get you to God, just substitute that in there. Imagine your prayer to God. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, but here's what I do. Here's how I'm different. Here's how I'm better. Here's what makes me acceptable to God. Just substitute that into that prayer. Because if you're a moralist, that's where you belong. Carrier of death. Look at verse 13. But the tax collector, the bad guy, as society would have looked at it, the tax collector standing far off would not even lift his eyes to heaven, 
but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now look at Jesus' comment, verse 14. I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. The guy that all of society would have thought, there's the guy. That Pharisee, I can't, have you seen what he gives? Did you see what he gave to the temple? Did you see what he bought for the temple last week? Did you, you've been down on the street corner when he gives the money. Have you seen what this guy does? That's the good guy. That's the one they would have thought Jesus would say, yep, he's in. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Does Jesus want his good works? Absolutely, but only after he has his heart. It's no good without his heart. It's no good without his repentance. It's no good without his acknowledgement of the sin that's within, and the acknowledgement that only Jesus can save him. And so Jesus says, it's the tax collector. It's the one who said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's the only, way, the only thing he knew to say. And the implication is God was merciful to that man. He broke the cycle of contamination by throwing himself on the mercy of God. That's the gospel. More or less infect everyone around them, their carriers. Just before we came to Colorado, PBS had a, had a film on that was called My Son Jack. Some of you might remember it. It was, it was a true story based on the life of Rudyard Kipling, the, the, the English author. Kipling had a son who at the outbreak, time of the outbreak of World War I was 17 years old. And of course he was anxious to immediately get into the fight like most young men his age were in those days. So his dad tried to help him. He made appointments with him with the army and with the navy and so on because he was a well-known author by that time. But Jack failed every, or his son, son failed every, yeah, son Jack failed every test because his eyesight was so bad. He still wanted to go. He and his father were both devastated because he, was a, because he was a very famous author. He finally was able to, to manage to get an officer's commission in the Navy for his, or the Army for his son as a second lieutenant. Age 17. Immediately his family, his mother and his sister knew this is dangerous. It'd be just like a second lieutenant today. It's about the most dangerous position you can be in if you're in battle. But Jack proved to be a very popular and effective officer. Within six months, he found himself on the continent in France, and on his 18th birthday, he received orders to go over the top. And those of you who know about World War I warfare know that meant get out of the trench, climb the ladder, go into no man's land, and try and attack, which both sides had done over and over and over again without any success whatsoever. But he had the orders, and he went. Shortly thereafter, his family was notified that he was missing in action. Three long years went by. The father was desperate to get information, so he began to find out who the, he began to find out who, who were the fellow soldiers with his son, and he began to call on them, and he would write them and get some of them to come by the house, and he tried to find out what had happened to his son. Well, after three years, he finally found the one who knew. He found the one who's, who was able to tell him, I saw your son, Jack. I know what happened to him. He died with honor. But he died on that battlefield. He was doing his duty. Well, after the soldier left his home, the film portrays that Rudyard, Rudyard and his wife had a talk. And the father explained how his son was lucky to die without facing a lot of pain. He was trying to take comfort in something and trying to comfort his wife. And his wife said, yes, that may be true, but I miss him. I miss him desperately. And Rudyard broke down and he said, yes, I miss him too. And then he began to sob and then he said this. He said, if I am to blame, what have I sent him to? Meaning, what have I sent him to after death? The death was bad enough, but Kipling had no faith. He said, if I am to blame, what have I sent him to? Have I sent my own son 
to oblivion. I can't answer the question what he sent his son to. What I do know is if he sent his son to that battlefield without faith in Jesus Christ, he didn't send his son to oblivion. He sent his son to hell, beloved. You can't just be an isolated carrier of defilement. You are, whoever you are, a distributor of defilement. Unless the message of the gospel radiates from your life, do you see what Jesus is trying to say? If it's just all about being good, you're just dressing up death. It has to be about the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, and I pray it is. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this message. It's somber, but I imagine it was a somber lunch when you delivered this kind of message to the Pharisees who invited you. I'm sure it didn't go the way they wanted it to go, but it went the way it needed to go. It imparted eternal truths. It didn't cover up defilement for the next 30 years or whatever time frame they may have lived only to find that it was all defilement after all. Jesus wanted them to look at their heart. He wanted them to examine. Lord, I pray you'll help us to do that. Maybe some here this morning and today is the day when they really take a hard look at the sin and the selfishness that resides within and they've never really turned that over to you. They've never said, I accept Jesus' death in my place. Lord, help them. But I just pray that you'll capture those hearts today. Do it today. Don't let them go another day without saying, I, 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 I want what Jesus is offering here. I want the eternal life that he offers. I see that I'm just covering it over. I want Jesus. Could be some of us here as believers, Father, who, yes, we are true believers, but our life has become about fooling people. It's become about looking spiritual rather than being spiritual. The truth is, our whole salvation is very much in question if that's us, but there's that outside possibility that someone would be a real Christian and yet not be living it. Lord, I pray you would speak to them as well get their attention to realize that they're not just taking themselves down the wrong road. They're defiling others. Oh, how we will regret that if the day comes and we have not done all we can to make clear the gospel of the free gift of Jesus Christ. One reason we should all be involved in free day. We should all be doing what we can to support Carla with the VBS and the other activities here that allow us to reach, try to reach our community. Give us hearts, Lord, that beat like yours, I pray. Thank you for this time. Help as we sing this closing hymn together that it might be the hymn of our heart. Reflect what we really, commitment that we want to make to you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.